Hi guys! Today's lecture is going to be over arterial hemodynamics. So this lecture is going to just explain how blood moves throughout the body and throughout normal and abnormal vessels. And so if you guys can have a really good understanding of this, this is going to help you to answer a lot of questions that you may come across. Um, this is a lot of physics, so it's not my most favorite lecture, but it will be totally fine and we will get through it and I'll explain things as simple as I know how to. Um, so hopefully this all makes sense and if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out and ask. So whenever I go through this lecture, there's a few terms that I just want you guys to know um, that I'm, I'll be using. So if you will just kind of write these down as I tell you. So volume flow is going to be just how much flow. Um, velocity is how fast is our blood moving throughout the body. Whenever I use the term steady, so that is referring to like a constant velocity. Um, pulsatile is going to be a variable velocity and that is due to cardiac contraction. And then if I talk about phasic flow, this is going to be a variable velocity and that's going to be due to respiration. Okay, so those are just a few terms that I want you guys to be familiar with. So as we've discussed in the past, the job of the arterial system is to carry blood away from the heart and outward to the most distant tissues. So remember our microcirculation is going to go from arteries to arterioles, capillaries, venules, veins, and then back to the heart. So which layer of the arterial wall is predominantly made up of the elastic material? Do you guys remember what that one would be? So we have our tunica intima, tunica media, and tunica adventitia. So remember that our tunica media is the one that allows the arteries to contract with the heart. So that's the one that's made up of a lot of elastic material. So it oscillates by each beat of the heart, and then each heartbeat is going to pump approximately 70 milliliters of blood in the aorta, and that's going to cause a blood pressure. So now let's talk about how cardiac contraction occurs. So there's going to be pressure in our left ventricle that builds up, which is going to cause that aortic valve to open and blood is going to then be released. Okay, so then our blood pressure is going to rise. And then the amount of blood ejected is called our stroke volume. So a patient's cardiac status plays an important role in the movement of blood throughout the vascular system. So think about our heart is contracting, so it's contracting and relaxing. So whenever they have an increased heart rate, that means it's contracting and relaxing faster, whereas a decreased heart rate would be slower. So if the patient has an increased heart rate, they're going to have an increased amount of blood that is being ejected out of that left ventricle. So an increased heart rate would be an increased blood volume, whereas a decreased heart rate would be a decreased blood volume. So you guys should be familiar with this process within this picture. And so this is just how blood moves throughout the body. So remember this left ventricle is where things begin. So that pressure is gonna rise in the left ventricle, which is gonna cause that aortic valve to open and blood is gonna be ejected into the aorta. So then it's going to move into our large arteries and then into arterioles, capillaries, venules, then into the large veins, to the vena cava, and then back into the right atrium. So the heart pump is what is going to generate the pressure to move the blood. So that's cardiac contraction and relaxation is going to cause that pressure to move the blood out into the arterial system. So the amount of blood ejected is going to create a pressure or energy wave. Just know that pressure and energy are going to be used interchangeably. So that's going to travel throughout the arterial system. And then the pumping action of the heart is what's going to maintain a high pressure gradient or pressure difference between the arteries and veins. So cardiac output, so that is how effective is our left ventricle. So how much blood is it putting out? So that is what determines the amount of blood that enters the arterial system. And then arterial pressure and peripheral resistance. So anything happening distal 
determines the amount of blood that leaves the arterial system. So you need to know those two things. Know what determines the amount of blood that enters the arterial system and what determines the amount of blood that leaves the arterial system. So when cardiac contraction is happening, this causes the arteries to become distended just for a brief moment. So that has two important purposes. So one is to create a reservoir that stores blood volume and then the second is during systole, when the left ventricle ejects blood out into the aorta, the arterial walls are going to stretch, which is going to create potential energy. And we're going to talk about potential energy in the next couple of slides. So potential energy is going to be stored in the distended arterial wall, and then it's going to be released when the wall recoils. So pressure is going to be greater at the heart because you know we have that left ventricle increased pressure so it's going to be greater at the heart and then that blood is going to eject into the aorta and it's going to gradually decrease as the blood moves more distally out into the arms and legs. So this is going to create a pressure difference or a pressure gradient and this is important to maintain blood flow. So the movement of any fluid between two points is going to require two things. So those two things would be a pathway that the fluid or blood can flow through, so that would be your vessel, and then a difference in energy or pressure levels between the two points, so that would be your pressure gradient. So the amount of flow is going to depend on your pressure gradient and also any resistance within the pathway that is going to oppose movement. So um, with an artery, something that would oppose movement would be plaque. So that would cause some resistance within the pathway versus a nice open, no plaque artery. So if we take a look at this vessel, here we've got a pressure of 100 millimeters mercury at the proximal end. And at the distal end, we have 100 millimeters mercury as well. So there's not a pressure difference between proximal and distal of this artery. But if we take a look at this vessel, so we've got 100 millimeters mercury proximally and then 75 millimeters mercury distally. So what does that tell us? So that tells us that there's a greater amount of flow in this bottom vessel because there's a greater pressure gradient or pressure difference. So the greater the pathway resistance or energy losses, the lower the amount of flow, okay? So if you imagine that you are trying to get through a section of highway, so think about if it is a nice open highway, a lot of cars are going to go through, a lot of blood can go through that nice open vessel. Whereas if you come up to a traffic jam, not as many cars are going to get through that section of highway, right, because there's a traffic jam happening. So same thing if you're in a stenosed vessel, not as much blood is going to get through that section of the vessel. So if you have lower resistance, so less traffic or an open vessel, you're going to have a higher flow amount versus if you had a higher resistance, so a lot of traffic or stenosis, you're going to have a lower amount of blood flow going through. So now we're going to talk about our different forms of energy. So pressure energy is also going to be known as potential energy or stored energy. So this is when the ejection of blood from the heart into the arteries causes those arterial walls to distend and our blood is stored there for just a quick, not even second. <laughs> so this energy is going to be released when the walls recoil, which is going to be a major form of energy for blood circulation. So if you think about a rubber band, whenever, if you're going to shoot it at somebody, so first you're going to stretch out that rubber band. So that is your potential energy. Okay, and then whenever you release that band, and it's shooting forward, that's going to be your kinetic energy, which we're going to talk about on the next slide. So now let's talk about kinetic energy, also known as movement energy. So this is the ability of flowing blood to do work as a result of its velocity. So it's the energy of something in motion. So kinetic energy is what moves that blood forward. So remember with our rubber band example, so we 
stretch out the rubber band, so that's our potential energy, and then our kinetic energy is when that is moving, that rubber band is moving forward. So with regard to blood flow, our kinetic energy portion is smaller compared to the pressure energy. So that seems weird to say that our potential energy has a greater effect on blood flow versus our kinetic energy because you think kinetic energy, it's the blood that's moving throughout the body. But the thing is, is so imagine your rubber band again. If you don't stretch out your rubber band very far, it's not going to shoot very far. So same thing with your potential energy. If you don't have a lot of that potential energy that is stored, then you're going to have less kinetic energy that is moving that blood forward. So we're going to talk about this picture of this dam really quick. Um, so what gravitational energy is, we're going to talk about it on the next slide, but basically it's potential energy that's held by an object because of its high position compared to a lower position. So an example, an everyday example would be a pin that's being held above a table. So that's going to have a higher gravitational potential than a pin that is sitting on the table. Um, so with this picture of the dam, this is going to be your potential energy, the water stored back here. And then the dam is going to act as the gravitational energy. And then this water flowing through the dam is going to be your kinetic energy. So hopefully that helps you guys to kind of understand the three different types of energy that we're talking about. So now let's go through gravitational energy and we're also going to talk about hydrostatic pressure. So these are used interchangeably and they are going to be expressed in millimeters of mercury, which is this MMHG. Okay, so gravitational energy is equivalent to the weight of a column of blood, which is just a section of blood extending from the heart to the level where the pressure is being measured. So if we are measuring hydrostatic pressure at the ankle level, and Buddy the elf is standing next to another normal size elf. So where is Buddy's heart versus a normal elf's heart? So it's higher, right? Because he is much bigger than a normal size elf. So hydrostatic pressure is the weight of a column of blood that extends from the heart to the level where we're measuring. So we're measuring at the ankle. So who do you think has more hydrostatic pressure at the ankle? Buddy, because he has a higher column of blood. So a higher column of blood is going to equal more hydrostatic pressure and increase gravitational pressure. Okay, so with an average size patient lying supine, arteries and veins are nearly at the same level of the heart. So that's going to mean that our mean venous pressure at the level of the ankle is going to be about zero millimeters mercury. And then whenever that patient stands up, our hydrostatic pressure is going to increase and add approximately 100 millimeters mercury to the mean venous pressure so that the total venous pressure is approximately 100 millimeters mercury. So that's all you guys need to know about the three forms of energy. So if you remember, what do we need for blood to move from one point to another? So there's two things that we need. So we need a pathway and then we need an energy gradient or a pressure gradient. So remember that that is a pressure difference. So remember that at the heart, our pressure is gonna be higher, and then as the blood moves more distally, it's gonna be lower. Okay, so now what causes that pressure to change distally? So that would be friction or heat loss. So our red blood, red blood cells, as they're moving throughout the body, they are rubbing against each other and rubbing against that arterial wall. So that is what causes our pressure to become less more distally. So inertia is the tendency of objects to maintain their status quo with regard to motion. So once blood is moving, it wants to continue moving. Um, as blood moves further out to the periphery, energy and pressure are going to dis dissipate largely in the form of heat. So it's going to be just like a soccer ball. If you were to stand at the one end of a soccer field and kick a soccer ball, well, at some point it's going to slow way down, and that's because of that friction. Um, you know, your grass and everything rubbing up against the ball, that's causing the ball to eventually come to a stop.
So what keeps our blood from eventually coming to a stop is the pumping action of the heart because that's going to continually restore this energy. Okay, so now we're going to take a look at this waveform and just talk about the different parts of the waveform really quickly. So A is our onset of systole, so this represents that the aortic valve is open. So during the acceleration phase of the pulse, pressure is going to be evenly distributed in all directions. And then we've got B, which is our peak systole. So this is where they're going to measure their highest velocity on like a carotid exam or a lower arterial exam. So this is where um, the greatest velocities are observed is peak systole. So C is going to be your early, I'm sorry, late systole. Um, so that is going to be where your cardiac output decreases, your pressure declines, and then there's going to be this temporary flow reversal down here. And then this little area here is your dichrotic notch, and so that represents aortic valve closure. And then D, so this is early diastole, so flow is going to be moving forward again. And then E is your late diastole, so during diastole the pressure wave is going to quickly move throughout the system. The vessel is going to recoil and convert potential energy to kinetic energy and that's going to help to maintain flow more distally. Now let's talk about blood flow characteristics and what kind of affects blood moving through the body. So the movement of blood through an artery is going to depend on both the physical properties of the blood, so that could be like how thick the blood or how thin the blood is, and then also the interaction between the artery and the blood. So the longer the artery, the longer the blood is going to be in contact with the artery, which is going to require a higher pressure to maintain flow. So if you have an increased vessel length, that there's going to be a decreased flow due to frictional losses. So it's just like kicking that soccer ball down the field. I'll just use that example again. If you kick it all the way down the field, there's going to be a lot of frictional losses. Whereas if you just kick it to your teammate standing next to you, there's not going to be as much frictional losses. So viscosity, so we're going to talk about the thickness of blood or the thinness of blood. So viscosity is the thickness of a fluid. So if blood is thin, it's going to move pretty freely throughout an artery. So patients who are anemic, their blood is thin compared to patients who are not anemic. So it's going to move pretty freely throughout the artery. So if blood is thick, it's going to move a little less freely throughout the artery, so it's going to be a little bit slower. So if you have an increased viscosity, so increased thickness, that's going to be a decreased velocity. And then if you have decreased viscosity, such as an anemic patient, then that will be have an increased velocity. So just like we talked about in the circulatory system, energy is going to be lost in the form of heat as the layers of red, red blood cells rub up against each other and against the arterial wall, which creates friction. So the thicker the fluid, the more molecular attraction, so the more energy is required to move the fluid. So remember, thick fluid has a decreased velocity. So in part, the dimensions of the vessels, so the diameter, determine the amount of friction and energy loss. So the smaller the vessel, the greater the friction and resistance. So if you think about a vessel that has plaque and it doesn't have a very good or very big lumen, that's going to have greater friction and greater resistance versus a vessel that is completely open with no plaque. And so another way to think of that is, let's say that you are in a really small space that you're trying to get out of. So you're going to have more resistance and more friction that you're rubbing up against the sides of that space versus if it was a big open space and you could easily get out of that big open space. There wouldn't really be resistance or friction preventing you from getting out. So both viscosity, thickness of the blood, and vessel length are going to affect resistance. 
However, a change in vessel diameter or radius is going to have an even more dramatic effect on resistance. So that's where this equation comes in. There's nothing that you have to really solve with this equation, but you need to know what the variables stand for and then just how they're related to resistance. So this is our resistance equation. So R stands for resistance. This N is viscosity, so thickness of the blood. L is the length of the vessel. And then R to the fourth is our radius. So you just need to memorize this equation because this is going to help you on so many questions um, that I will ask you and then also that registries may ask you. And so how you know what, how these things are related to resistance is everything on the numerator is directly related to resistance. So if we have increased viscosity, then we have an increased resistance. Increased length of the vessel, increased resistance. If we have decreased velocity, I mean viscosity, then we have decreased resistance. Decreased length of the vessel, decreased resistance. Radius is going to be indirectly related. So if our radius goes down, so the reason that our radius of a vessel would go down is a stenosis or plaque. So <clears throat> our radius goes down, that means our resistance goes up because our vessel is getting smaller, right? So that would cause increased resistance. Okay, so you just need to be able to know those relationships and be able to figure out questions based on that. So let's talk about laminar flow. So this is going to be considered to be even, well-organized, and stable flow. And the blood is going to move in concentric layers. So each very thin layer is going to flow at a different velocity. And it's going to be slowest at the vessel wall. And you need to know that it's going to be fastest at the center of the vessel. So that's why when we Doppler an artery, we're going to Doppler at the center of the vessel, not at the wall because um, you, you want to get your fastest velocity. So there's two types of laminar flow. So it's going to be plug flow and parabolic flow. Here's some pictures of kind of what those look like. So plug flow is blunted flow. It occurs when all of the blood cells and layers travel at the same velocity, and it's usually going to be seen at the origin of vessels. So you do need to know that. So parabolic flow that has a profile that resembles the shape of a bullet and it's usually going to be seen downstream or more peripherally once laminar flow is fully developed. So flow again is going to be slower near the vessel wall and then fastest at the center of the vessel. So there are two main sources of energy loss. So one we have talked about quite a bit already. So our viscous energy loss is going to be due to increased friction between molecules and layers, which ultimately causes energy loss. And then the second one is going to be our inertial energy loss. So this is the biggest loss of energy in our circulatory system. Yes, a body at motion they wants to stay in motion, but that's only if there is no curves or branches or tributaries or anything that has to change the direction of blood flow, which there are all of those things throughout the body. So inertial losses are caused by changes in direction or velocity. So the parabolic flow pro profile is going to become flattened and flow is going to move in a disorganized fashion. So this type of energy loss is usually going to occur at the exit of a stenosis. So that's kind of a good example of when you would see this type of energy loss would be at an exit of a stenosis. So I'm never good at pronouncing this guy's name. Um, I think it's Pisau's Law. Uh, I'm not really sure, so I just call it P's Law. <laughs> so this defines the relationship between volume flow, which is going to be Q in our equation that we're going to look at in just a minute. And then P is the pressure and also resistance. So it would be written as Q equals P over R. So it helps to answer the question of how much fluid is moving through a vessel. So we are going to combine the above equation with the resistance equation. And so P's law is stated as this. So Q equals P1 minus 2 pi R to the fourth 
divided by 8 viscosity length of the vessel. So Q is our volume flow, P1 is our pressure gradient. So P1 is pressure at the proximal end of the vessel and P2 is the pressure at the distal end of the vessel. And then pi and then r to the fourth again is your radius, your little n is viscosity, and then l is the length of the vessel. So um, this equation is like, yeah, switched. That's the best way that I know to explain it from your resistance equation. So remember your resistance equation is r equals 8nl over pi r to the fourth. So what was on the numerator is now on the denominator and vice versa. So the radius of a vessel is going to now be directly proportional to the volume of flow. So that's the amount of flow. So a small change in the radius may result in large changes in flow. Um, so if somebody were to ask you um, if there is a decrease in the pressure gradient, what might that do to the overall volume? So if it's a decrease in the pressure gradient. So analyze this just as you would the resistance equation. So everything in the numerator is directly related to volume flow and everything in the denominator is going to be indirectly related. So if there is a decrease in the pressure gradient, there's going to be a decrease in the volume flow. If there's an increase in viscosity, then what might that do to volume flow? So that's going to decrease because it's opposite, it's inversely related. Okay. So now let's talk about what happens within a stenosis, specifically what happens with our velocity. So as the vessel radius decreases, so let's say there's a lot of plaque going on in a vessel, just like this picture. So the radius is much smaller compared to, say, this part of the vessel that is nice and open. So in this area, our radius is decreased, so there's going to be increased resistance. So the volume of blood flow through the vessel needs to try to remain constant because according to the basic laws of fluid dynamics, what goes in must come out. So the way that that happens, the way that um, volume flow is maintained as the vessel size decreases is that the velocity must increase. So if you look at this equation and analyze it just like we do the other equations that we've talked about, so V is velocity, Q is volume, and then A is area. So the size of a vessel, so area, is inversely proportional to the velocity of blood flow. So if we have a decreased diameter, we're going to have an increased velocity in that area. If our diameter is increased, so here, then our velocity should slow down. The speed of the blood should slow down. Okay. So you guys need to know that the total energy contained in moving fluid is going to be the sum of the potential kinetic and gravitational energies. So if one of those variable changes, the others must also change to maintain the total fluid energy at the same level. So you just kind of need to know that those two bullet points. So now we're going to talk about Bernoulli's principle. So this explains that velocity and pressure are inversely related. So as our velocity increases, then kinetic energy increases, which causes our pressure to decrease and then vice versa. So as velocity decreases, kinetic energy decreases, and our pressure is going to increase. So which one of these pictures has the higher velocity? So you've got an ICA, a little bit of stenosis with plaque here, and then on this picture you've got an abdominal aneurysm. So which one of these pictures is going to have a higher velocity? So a hint would be as area decreases or radius decreases, our velocity is going to increase. So this picture of the ICA is the one that would have an increased velocity. And then where would you find the lowest pressure? So remember what Bernoulli's principle explains. 
So the lowest pressure. So as velocity increases, pressure is going to decrease. So the one with the highest velocity is going to have the lowest pressure. So that, again, would be this picture here. So now we're going to talk about something called flow separation. And I just want you guys to be familiar with this. And if you were to ever see it, may, probably while doing a carotid exam, um, you would just know that this is a completely normal finding. So what happens when flow separation occurs is just a variation in the flow pattern and it can be caused by changes in the geometry of the vessel or the direction of the vessel. And so the reason that it's often seen with a carotid exam is at the carotid bulb whenever um, the geometry kind of changes in that vessel. So it gets a little bit bigger right there at the bulb. So flow separations leave behind regions of flow reversal, stagnant, or little movement. And then because blood moves from a high to low pressure, or a pressure gradient, the direction of flow in the region of flow separation, such as the carotid bulb, is going to change with respect to the transducer. So this is going to cause a visible color change in the color flow image during systole. And so that's what's this, what this picture is showing here. So it looks like a little bit of flow reversal is happening right here. And that's just to the, due to the flow separation. There is nothing abnormal about that. So during diastole, when flow at the vessel wall is stagnant, there's no movement of blood and therefore no color in the color flow image. So that's what this picture is demonstrating. So the flow separation pattern is an ideal one to use to help define whether an image is in systole or whether it's in diastole. So that's all that you guys need to know about flow separation. I think that you guys probably learned or have heard about Reynolds number whenever you did physics, whenever you took your physics registry, but all that we need to know about this for vascular is that your Reynolds number predicts when flow becomes unstable or disturbed, and when the Reynolds number exceeds 2,000, laminar flow tends to become disturbed. So you just need to be familiar with that number 2,000 and then that Reynolds number is just predicting when flow becomes unstable or disturbed. So we have mentioned the difference between a low resistive and high resistive waveform in the past lectures, um, but low resistive flow is going to be described as steady in nature throughout systole and diastole, which is feeding a dilated vascular bed. Um, vessels that are low resistive are going to be arteries that are feeding vital organs. So examples of those would be your ICA, which is feeding the brain, your vertebral arteries, renal arteries, celiac, splenic, and hepatic arteries are all characterized by low resistive flow. And this top image is just demonstrating what a low resistive waveform would look like. And then high resistive flow is going to be described as pulsatile in nature. So this is going to be seen in your ECA, subclavian artery, the aorta, iliac, um, extremity arteries, and fasting SMA. Um, I want y'all to be able to kind of look at these two images and be able to say that this would be a triphasic waveform because it has three phases here, so one, two, and three. And then this is a biphasic waveform because you've got your forward flow here and then reversal of flow, but you don't have this third phase that is the resumption of forward flow. So just kind of be familiar with those sort of things. So now we're going to talk about what your waveform is going to look like if you were scanning proximal to a stenosis or distal to a stenosis. Um, on this first slide, it's going to be proximal to a stenosis. And so this criteria and what I'm talking about is going to apply to all the arteries throughout the body. I just thought it would be easier for you guys to understand if I just use um, your CCA and ICA as an example. But like I said, this could apply to any, any other artery throughout the body. So this top picture is showing you your normal waveforms for your ICA. Remember it's feeding the brain, so it has that low resistive waveform, a lot of flow in diastole, 
And then if you were to compare that to your external carotid artery, you can see that there's not as much flow in diastole, so this is a high resistive waveform. And then your common carotid artery is kind of a mixture between the two, um, but it would be considered, you know, kind of low resistive waveform. It has a lot of flow in diastole. So if you are scanning proximal to a stenosis, so let's say you're scanning your common carotid artery and you are all of a sudden losing that diastolic component. So that is usually going to be consistent with an ipsilateral or same side ICA stenosis or occlusion. So instead of getting this waveform in your common carotid artery, you are losing this diastolic component, see, compared to here. So you've lost that diastolic component. So that means that you're approaching a stenosis or some sort of disease going on. So you're scanning proximal to a stenosis. So with an ICA occlusion, the CCA is going to take on the quality of an ECA, which is going to have a higher resistance flow pattern. Okay, so you just have to remember that when you're losing that diastolic component, that's telling you you're coming up on something. Diastole tells you where blood is going. So now we know that whenever we are proximal to a stenosis, our diastolic flow is what's going to be mostly affected. Um, it's not so much our systolic flow that is super affected whenever you're proximal to a stenosis. So remember that diastole tells you where blood is going. And then on this slide, we're going to talk about why systole tells you where the blood came from. So we're going to talk about distal to a stenosis. Um, so an example of this would be, let's say, I'm just going to use a leg for an example. So in your superficial femoral artery, so remember that is the artery that runs all the way down the thigh. So let's say that there is a stenosis in your SFA. So in your popliteal artery is where you might see these type of waveforms that we're going to talk about because that is distal to that superficial femoral artery. So distal to a stenosis, our dis disturbed flow patterns can be evident. And then there's going to be dampened waveforms, which are going to be characterized by decreased velocities, which is here. And it's going to have a more rounded upstroke. So see, this is rounded compared to this sharp peak here. Okay. Um, with that, that means there's a longer acceleration time. So that's something that registries like to use is those terms kind of interchangeably, rounded upstroke or increased acceleration time. So your high resistive flow is then going to turn into low resistive flow. Um, there can be turbulence and sometimes bidirectional flow observed also. So Distal to a stenosis, the term used for that waveform is called tardis parvus waveform. It's here. So tardis means a long rise time, so remember that rounded peak, and then a low PSV. So your velocity will be lower versus like this velocity. Okay, so that's what you're going to see distal to a stenosis. Now we're going to talk about collaterals. So in an extremity at rest, total blood flow can be fairly normal even in the presence of severe stenosis or complete occlusion, just like in this picture of the main artery, and in this picture it's your superficial femoral artery. And the reason for that is because you have these tiny vessels that can form that can um, kind of bypass that main artery and maintain blood flow to the extremity. So those are called collaterals. Um, the location of collateral vessels is going to help to provide a tentative indication of the obstruction level. So it's good to try to locate those and figure out what vessel it is that's obstructed and how severely and that sort of thing. So we're going to get into vasoconstriction and vasodilation um, a little bit more next semester. This is going to give you kind of an overview of those two things. So vasoconstriction, this is something that occurs whenever a patient is cold or nervous. And so the pulsatility of flow in medium size and small arteries of the limbs is going to increase. So your waveform is going to be very, very pulsatile. 
Um, with vasodilation, this occurs mainly um, once a patient has exercised, and so the pulsatility of flow in the medium size and small arteries of the limbs is going to decrease. So normally how you have that triphasic waveform, well now it's going to turn into kind of a low resistive looking waveform where it's not as pulsatile. So this picture is a vasoconstriction, and then this picture would be vasodilation. Just like I said on the previous slide, exercise should induce peripheral vasodilation in the microcirculation so that our distal peripheral resistance diminishes and blood flow is going to increase. So vasoconstriction and vasodilation of the blood vessels within muscles are also going to be influenced by the sympathetic nervous system. So just like how I said, if a patient is cold or nervous, then that is going to cause them to um, vasoconstrict. Um, so exercise is probably the best single vasodilator of high resistance vessels. And then we also have something called autoregulation. So this helps just control vasoconstriction and vasodilation. So this accounts for the ability of most vascular beds to maintain a constant level of blood flow over a wide range of perfusion pressures. So with increased blood pressure, that is going to cause our blood vessels to vasoconstrict. And then with a decreased blood pressure, that causes dilation of resistance vessels. So if you see a low resistive monophasic Doppler flow signal, so that's this picture here, that can be present in a normal artery after the patient has exercised because the exercise is causing that peripheral dilation and reducing that flow resistance. However, the same pattern can also be pathological. We talked about what it looks like to scan distal to a stenosis. So if this were in a leg, this would not be a normal waveform to see. Unless the patient has been exercising, then it could be normal. But if you see this waveform and the patient has not been exercising, has not done anything to have vasodilation, then we've got to think, is there something going on proximal to where I'm scanning? And we've got to kind of investigate that. So this can be in response to a proximal arterial obstruction. And then if you were to see a high resistance signal, let me pull up this picture. That can occur from normal vasoconstriction, just like we talked about, or it can also be from a distal arterial obstruction. So you can see this waveform, remember that loss of the diastolic flow, you could see that if you were scanning proximal to a stenosis. So again, you would need to investigate if there's no reason for the patient to be vasoconstricted. So we can have a stenosis that is not considered to be hemodynamically significant. So hemodynamically significant stenosis is going to cause a major reduction in volume flow and pressure. Um, so a stenosis usually becomes hemodynamically significant when the cross-sectional area of the arterial lumen is reduced by 75%, and that's going to correspond to a diameter reduction of 50%. And these pictures kind of demonstrate that. But it is important that you guys know that a cross-sectional area of the arterial lumen is reduced by 75% corresponds to a diameter reduction of 50%. The occurrence and degree of a hemodynamic abnormality produced by a stenosis depends on many factors, and here are some of the factors. So the length of the narrowing, diameter of the narrowing, Roughness of the endothelial surface, so smooth plaque or if it's rough and irregular. Um, the shape and degree of narrowing. Um, arterial venous pressure gradient. Peripheral resistance distal to the stenosis. And collateral circulation. So if there are two or more stenotic lesions that occur in a series, so in the same vessels, that's going to have a greater effect on volume flow and distal pressure than a single lesion of an equal total length. So if you think about a car crash on the interstate, well, one is going to cause some major problems and major backup, whereas two is going to cause even more. It's going to be worse than one. So if you have two consecutive wrecks, 
um, just like two consecutive stenosis, stenosi, I don't know the plural of stenosis. Um, anyways, if you have two that are consecutive, that is going to be worse than just having one that is of the same equal total length. And then if you, if there are two stenosis in two different vessels that are parallel to one another, the overall resistance to flow is going to be less than the resistance in each individual stenosis. So this is because less volume of blood flow is going through each narrowing. Okay guys, this is the last slide of this lecture. So we talked about proximal and distal to a stenosis. So now we need to talk about what happens um, within a stenosis and then on this slide, whenever I'm saying proximal to a stenosis, I'm saying like directly before the stenosis begins and then post-stenotic turbulence is directly after that stenosis. So whereas previously I'm talking about a little more um, distant, so I was talking about like an ICA stenosis, what's happening in our CCA or a... SFA stenosis, what's having it happening in our popliteal artery. So this is talking about directly before, within the stenosis, and then directly after that stenosis. So proximal to the stenosis, our flow fre frequencies are going to be usually dampened with or without disturbance. And then within a stenosis, let me bring this picture up. So as flow enters, or passes through and exits the stenosis, there's going to be an increase in our Doppler shift frequencies and velocities. So your velocities should go up. So the increased range of Doppler shift frequencies is going to be displayed as spectral broadening, which is what is shown in this picture. And flow is going to become disorganized and unstable as those elevated frequencies and velocities and eddy currents disrupt normal flow. So then post-stenotic turbulence, let me bring this picture up. So that's typically going to be seen at the exit of a stenosis. Such flow is characterized by flow reversals, flow separations, vortices, and eddy currents, which ultimately produce the bidirectional disturbed flow pattern. So you can see that there's some flow here coming below the baseline. So there's that bidirectional, and then it's obviously disturbed flow pattern. It's not a nice and neat waveform. Okay, so that is everything for arterial hemodynamics. I know this is a lot of information. So guys, please, please, if you have questions, um, reach out to me. Let me know. I can try to explain it in a different way or I don't know. I know this is a hard lecture. So just let me know if you guys have any questions. Thank you.